What do I actually really care about? Unburdened by familial expectations, unburdened by anything other than what's kind of most enriching. I've got a family, I have three sons. That's always, you know, you can send them to college and, you know, you got to pay attention to the money. But yeah, it's just, uh, just over time got really, really clear about the things that I value. What are the immovable principles for me? Hey everyone, it's Angie Wachowski, New York Times bestselling author of Spark, Leading from the Front and Bet on You. And you know me, 2024, this is the year of transformation. Now you don't have to change everything, but maybe there's an aspect of your life right now that you want to maybe make some changes, maybe make some adjustments. Maybe you're ready for a full-blown transformation. Well, I am your person. This podcast, this whole year, is really dedicated to transformational change, and I cannot think of anything more transforming than having the courage, day in, day out, to live your life. And this is our next guest. It's actually a colleague of mine, Russ Laraway from the Marine Corps. And I like to think about the Marine Corps. You learn a lot about how to take physical risks, you know, running towards the sound of chaos, I'm sure you can conjure up what those Marine Corps videos or commercials look like. You understand that there's a lot of physical risk involved. But I can speak for myself. When I left active duty and started working in the private sector, I became more aware of all these other risks I had to take as a young leader, like conversational risk, relational risk. I now had to carry a number. I started off in my career in pharmaceutical sales. You know, it's interesting in the Marine Corps, it's not a profit and loss environment. I mean, there certainly are obvious costs to, to wartime situations that you're training, preparing for, but it's very different than being measured each quarter on your performance. And those were kind of really fearful times for me. Then I became an entrepreneur and then had to, what I say, just, you know, eat what I killed, right? Go out there, ask for business, try to develop relationships to get to contracts, to get to opportunities. There was a lot of putting myself out there that I didn't necessarily have to do early stage career, but I was now doing it. So courage is a part of our daily life. And so I wanted to invite Russ Laraway here, author of a really amazing book, which we'll talk about. So if you're a manager in this world, you need to up your skills, you need to get a little bit more daily courage. He's going to talk a lot about managerial courage, but you're going to hear through Russ's story just about how this courage, this living bravely a mantra has been a huge part of his entire life. Cannot wait to have Russ join us. Hey, Russ, I just want to thank you for being on the Bet On You show. Before we get into your impressive background and career guidance and about your book, too, can you just share with us your story? I think in the context of your show, uh, for your audience, I think I actually need to start with um, my grandparents. And, I'm, and I promise you, I'm not going to go all the way, but, but I, think it's, I think it's a critical place to start. On, on my mother's side of my family were immigrants. Uh, my grandfather, her, her father, uh, Frank Scarvaglione, uh, was a poor Southern Italian, turn of the 20th century. They came over in waves with no English and no money um, for the promise of a better life. Uh, on her mother's side, the Curcios, also Italian, um, that great-grandfather, th way different story. He was a cabinet maker for King Emmanuel, had a school in Foggia, Italy. And uh, yeah, and was called the maestro because he was a teacher. Um, long story made short, uh, one of the, there's a nationalized police force in Italy called the Carabinieri, still, still around today, was around in the 18, late 1800s. And one of the police officers um, acted inappropriately toward my great grandfather's sister. He demanded justice. He's five feet tall, by the way, this guy, uh, Michele Curcio. Uh, he demanded justice. No justice was forthcoming. Uh, the guy was a cop and a little bit protected. So my great-grandfather got a bat and beat the guy up. And then he had to flee from Fudge to Napoli. And then his friend said, the Carabinieri have a long arm and a longer memory, and you need to go to the U.S. And then he came to the U.S. and he couldn't get basic carpentry work. You know, and, I, and I, I, that's, that's us. On my dad's side, we're long-term Americans, but very, you know, lower middle class. And, and that's really how I grew up, lower middle class. Um, Mom was home. Dad was a shift worker for the Philadelphia Electric Company. 
And, and, and the only reason that is important, given the nature of your show, we're going to skip ahead a lot here, I think is because um, I grew up free from substantial expectations. It was always assumed I would go to college. My sister was the first college graduate in our family. I was the first to get a master's degree. Um, and that alone was in, an enormous achievement in our family. And, and if you think about a lot of the people who are successful or, or um, maybe not as successful as they would like, they are, they are often burdened by these expectations that their families have had for them. And I look back and I feel lucky to have been unburdened by that. So you fast forward, you know, I was in the Marines. I got out. I started a company that did supply chain consulting. Um, my buddy and I, uh, that I've known since seventh grade, we founded that. We had people in the company we knew in the Marines, another guy knew in the Army, and friend from fifth grade, all that. It was so fun. Sold that. Uh, I went to Wharton. He went to Kellogg. And then it's Google, Twitter, Radical Candor, Qualtrics, you know, and and there's really interesting themes, I think, in the context of risk taking and all that that I, that I think we'll dive into a bit. But that's that's kind of kind of my story with sort of each stop uh, in the in the tech world, each stop being a little more scope, a little more seniority, ending at chief people officer at Qualtrics, and then I, I've been working with a VC company for the last couple of years. What I'm so impressed by, because leaving the Marine Corps, I learned a lot about certainly as did you about how to take physical risks you know, run towards the sound of chaos, do whatever you have to do to, to save the team. But I'm so impressed that you had the courage to start a business after that experience, because I have heard, and I think there's research to support it, that Marines and military service members make excellent entrepreneurs. Yet I don't think that I had the, I'll say entrepreneurial courage, or maybe even the financial security to even imagine starting a business, let alone the know-how of how to start it. I did a few years later after I left active duty. You're learning about risk-taking in the Marine Corps. How do you leverage that for that next step and that next step and that next step? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, fun, it's a good question. Uh, by the way, I, I would say every, every new job I stepped into, I was not only unqualified for, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and, and, and that's got a lot of hair on it. Uh, we could unpack that for about a week, but funny when I when I um, when I interviewed for Google at Wharton, Kim Scott, who wrote Radical Candor, she was actually my first interview. Oh, really? Uh, I learned later on she didn't want to interview me because I'd been in the Marines, and she herself, her own words, pinko feminist. Um, luckily, Google was one of my last interviews because I had been confronted with the very obvious notion that interviewing is about being excluded. And I found all these ways people were excluding me. And I, it took me a minute. Um, you know, I was at Omnicom, for example, big marketing company. They already knew who they wanted. They just, I was cannon fodder. They had to justify a full day of interviews. They thought maybe this guy's interesting. They already know the person from my class they wanted. They just graduated last year. Terrible interviewers. Um, and I, I learned that through the interview process. So the first thing Kim says to me is, what does a Marine know about being entrepreneurial? Is that crazy given the question you said? That was her first question. I was so lucky that I confronted similar questions. I, and I said, Kim, it sounds to me like everything you know about military leadership, you learned off of TV and movies. Uh, do you mind if I take a crack at reframing you? Now, it turns out her personality type, uh, that there's nothing better in the world you could have said to her than to challenge her that way. Radical candor, care personally, challenge directly. And I went on to describe exactly how entrepreneurial the battlefield is especially, you know, rapid decision making, gather as much information as you can, but make decisions, you know, the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act, right? Um, and when you make a decision, the system changes, you take action, repeat that loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. Um, also talked about how leadership is leadership. You have a vision, you have a mission, you have to go to your cross-functional partners and build coalition and support. You have to work with your boss and your peers and all that. It's like no different. And I think she really appreciated that. Um, I think, uh, you know, getting out of the Marines specifically and then going into that entrepreneurial venture, I, I didn't know what I was doing. My buddy had the, I guess, vertical industry kind of knowledge, but he was attracted to the idea that I would know how to build a team. And so that's how we sort of divided our labor. Now, credit to him uh, for understanding that was important. It's just not that common. And we had a good run for five years. But what I'd say risk taking in the career, here, here's, there's two things that I never, uh, uh, ignored, which were my two principles for my career. Hard problems with good people. Do something that matters for something that matters, right? And for something that matters is very is mission, usually. 
and do something that matters to my role. Hard problems, good people. The reason that's interesting is when I left Google, when I left Twitter, even Qualtrics, the truth is I left a bunch of money on the table. Uh, it was safer to stay in each of those places, just safer from a, a sort of personal financial gain standpoint. But what was true in all three cases was I was just sort of starting to feel underutilized and a little bored. Hard problems, good people. In, in one case there, the, the, the people started to change. They went from good people to not as good people. And, and uh, it was, you know, that was, if I'm going to stay in integrity, those are my principles, those two things. And it's clarifying, isn't it? Um, then you're willing to, um, you're willing to step into the breach. You're willing to step into that next big job, even if you're not qualified or you don't know what's going to happen. And so I don't know how much it was risk taking versus just honoring my two basic principles. Uh, I think with hindsight, I have friends that are still at Google, 17, 18 years. They've not been happy for a long time. The reason they're there is money. I mean, like, I, you know, not everyone, but they're there for money and it's safe. And they've, they've become, you know, in some cases, miserable. I love that idea of staying in integrity with yourself. And I think about a lot of trade-offs people make or, you know, stories that they tell themselves to not stay in integrity. Well, it's good money. Well, I've owned the house for 10 years. The kids are in school. And, you know, I think I call that like the play it safe paradox. You know, playing it safe obviously does that. It keeps you safe. But what often it denies you is your vision for yourself, your dreams, the things that help you find fulfillment. So it's paradoxical. It can keep you safe, but is it going to keep you happy? And for you, it's being in integrity with yourself that helps guide your decisions. So can you talk about how you came up with those principles? Because I think that'd be really valuable for people as they contemplate decisions in their life. Like, what are my guardrails? What are my decision-making criteria? How do I stay true to my own self despite the circumstances I find myself in? Yeah. Um, so they are... They are tidy sounding sound bites, um, but underneath them is, a t is an awful lot of depth. Um, you know, it's like anything. Initially, I wasn't particularly conscious of them. Um, I think at Google, uh, a number of things started to happen. Um, I started to be sought after more and more for help on career stuff for others. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a simple example. Um, I, I did probably, I don't know, thousands of interviews at Google. And there was a common question I got, which is, how is Google keeping its culture while you grow so fast? You know, and I, it was the most unoriginal question, but, you know, the interviewers, people I was interviewing would ask me back. But I devised, I, I had to become conscious about what the answer was. And, and so I could kind of give a, a really good answer to them o over time. So, um, so similarly, in advising others in their careers, um, you have to be careful about projecting your own um, dreams or desires or what you value. You have to be a little careful about that and get into their unique problem situation, their wants, dreams, desires, all that stuff. Um, and so after a while, it becomes important to try to abstract out or, extra or, or kind of pull out, like, what, what are the immovable principles for me? Because I would inevitably get asked that question. And it took me some time to really get underneath what it was I really sought. You know, the the number one thread back from the Marines that I, I know you will, um, it will resonate with you is mission orientation, like really, really important aspect of our lives back then. You know, it was for, for us, it was locate, close with and destroy, <laughs> you know, um, then bypassing, bypassing collapse with maneuver, you know, warfare. But um, but I, I, I'm very sensitive to mission. I can still tell you Google's mission, Twitter's mission, Qualtrics' mission, uh, the Marine Corps' mission. I just did it, you know. Um, and so you start, I don't know, you just start to be able to get underneath, what do I actually really care about? Uh, and by the way, unburdened by familial expectations, unburdened by anything other than what's kind of most enriching. I've got a family. I have three sons. God's always, you know, can send them to college and, you know, you got to pay attention to the money. But, um, yeah, it's just uh, just over time got really, really clear about the things that I value. And I think it was because young people seeking advice sort of forced me to become conscious of those principles. And I and that helped me to be a better advisor. I, I don't know, actually, but it took some time. It took some time for me to get clear on that. I think sometimes the simplest statements require the most amount of time to consolidate all these ideas into those statements. I want to think about courage for a second, because I think often when we hear that word, people describe it as if it's like this monolithic thing, 
where I have learned in my career that there's many shades of courage. There's relationship courage, there's candor, there's communications, there's physical courage, things that we learned in the Marine Corps. You co-created Radical Candor with Kim Scott. And I think that's one of the hardest things for people to do, to have courage in relationships, to speak truth in in a, in a way that um, is unfiltered. Can you talk about that moment with Radical Candor that you realize this not was not just a concept, but this is an organization. And I know she went on to write a book called Radical Candor. Can you talk about just where that idea came from and just the weight of it? Because I do think it's significant and is one of the hardest things that I think people struggle with in their lives. Yeah. And, and Kim and I, by the way, had founded a company around the book, uh, which we ran for a couple of years. Um, yeah. To say I was a co-creator would be a bit of a stretch. Um, I think if Kim were on here, she might agree with you, but I'm not sure it's fair to say I was a co-creator. Um, but if you think about it, um, there's two sort of really intuitive reasons why people are generally not fully, you know, truthful is one way to say it. You know, they're not, they're, they, they don't use candor with others. They pull their punches and it's a selfish reason and a selfless reason. The selfless reason is we've almost all been in a situation where we've been given some tough feedback and we know how it felt and we didn't like it. I don't care who you are. Generally, you'll have, even if you can sanitize it well, externally, internally, you'll have a defensive reaction to tough feedback. It's normal. Actually, to have that reaction is doesn't mean you're thin-skinned. It just means you're human. So anybody with even a tiny amount of empathy knows if I give tough feedback to someone, I'm going to incite a defensive, stressed, st stressful reaction in them. So we pull our punches for that selfless reason. The selfish reason tends to be man, I don't want to deal with their emotional response. You know, like, I don't need this. And, you know, you can just, you step forward two more steps and you realize it's just, you're just doing them a disservice. You're doing them a disservice um, by not offering them insights into how you believe they can improve. Or by the way, how you believe what the things they should continue to do to continue to be successful. They both matter a ton. Um, you're not doing your job as a, first of all, a manager uh, but I also argue as a peer, as a as a subordinate, um, giving people insight into what you can see about how they can improve is is a big part of everyone's job. People at work, they just want to be sick. They just want to do great work and be totally psyched while doing it. It turns out that improvement coaching, which Kim would call radical candor, which I call improvement coaching in my book, um, is one of the most important ways you can enable people to do that. And so you got to get over this selfish and selfless reason for, for not giving people tough feedback. And you got to get in there and you got to do it. The big secret, though, is you don't have the truth when you give them this feedback. There's four truths all around us, Angie. There's your truth, my truth, a shared truth you and I might be able to get to, and then an objective truth that I'm just going to, we don't have time to get into why, but it's not attainable in the workplace, in my opinion. Um, physics doesn't have a single theory. They have two th competing theories. You're going to tell me some problem we have in the workplace. There's an objective truth. There's not. And so the idea is I can offer you my insight on how you can be improving. I can give you radical candor um, or improvement coaching in my language. Um, but then I have to be open to sort of how you're feeling about that. And then maybe together, when I give you my truth and you give me yours, we can get to start to get to a shared truth, which is what really gives us an ability to take some action. So that's that's kind of the insight. That's a way through because it's not unfiltered. It's not I speak my truth. That's the end. It's I care about you. I want you to be successful. Here's precisely and clearly what I'm seeing that's getting in your way. And I'm doing that in your best interest, even if it doesn't feel like that. So that's that's sort of the big insight there. I think that's why radical candor ends up being magical um, is because of because of the, that nuance underneath the, the really awesome two by two. Um, that everybody's so familiar with now. And it takes a lot of work. and it, But it starts with bravery, just having the ability to raise a situation in a sk skillful way. I Not only a great book and a great organization, and it must have been for you an inspiration into your book, When They Win, You Win, which by the way, I recommended twice already today because to prepare for this, well, I read it a while ago, but to prepare for our conversation, I was rereading it. And I was talking to a management 
a manager of a management team. So manager of managers, I'm like, you know, you really got to get this book for your team and just create common language around what a manager's job is. And this is an organization that doesn't have a lot of L&D investment. And so take it upon yourselves to create common language for what is the job of a manager? How do we do this? <laughs> and let's go. Can you talk about the inspiration for your book? Yeah, it's, it's really simple. Um, it does kind of start with the Radical Candor experience. In fact, I, while I was working with Kim, I pitched an early idea for my book to her editor, which she rejected. Um, he became my editor eventually, by the way, but he just said, that's not a book. And I was like, damn it. I thought it was um, a book. <laughs> yeah, well, it, and it was. It was actually just for fun. It was part four of my current book. Okay. Um, is is kind of what, what that was about, which is career conversations, a model that I've devised over about 15 year period. Um, so neither here nor there. Um, I started to realize a couple things. One is um, I realized that Actually, the editor at one point asked him to take out a bunch of references to me because he was worried it was becoming a book about Russ. And so you start to think, oh, I, I maybe I have some ideas that are valuable. Um, and then what happened there that's by far most important is there's a lot of demand for what we were doing at Radical Candor. And I got to speak to a thousand companies. And I would always start off with a simple discovery question. You know, some version of what problem are you trying to, are you trying to solve or how can we be helpful? And what blew me away was big company, small company, didn't matter. didn't matter the industry from education to government to healthcare to tech. They gave me kind of the same answer, which was we have an engagement problem related to low manager skill. Uh, it, small companies didn't use sophisticated language like that. Bigger companies did. That's actually a direct quote, quote from uh, one woman I spoke to from a pretty big company. But that, that, that idea is what everybody said. I said, well, what's the skill gap? And one of them was around coaching, basically, which is what, you know, so Radical Candor was, I was coming in then to train them and help them scratch that itch a bit. But there was also sort of clarity of direction. It was, and career is a really big one. And so um, that's the big three in my book, direction, coaching, career. But that wasn't really good enough. That gave me an idea that, oh, it turns out there's a very common set of problems that most managers are floundering about around. And these sound like real. These sound like normal. These resonate with me. Then I got really lucky at Qualtrics. Um, got brought in by founder uh, Jared Smith, who I worked with at Google. He can't stand regular HR. So he wanted a business person to come in and he said, hey, fix my managers and then become the chief people officer and did that. And so I had a chance to study a set of leadership behaviors really in a quantitative way. Um, about 12 or so. Those tw 12 ladder up to be direction coaching and career, by the way. But I got to study them. Think about a set of leadership behaviors as the independent variable, the thing that doesn't change. But then employee engagement, which is really about happiness at work, and then business outcomes like quota attainment, contract renewal rate, lines of code checked in, whatever you care about as dependent variables. I had a team of quants and my people analytics team, and we studied literally the quantitative relationship between leadership behaviors and employee happiness and business outcomes. And uh, ultimately, the book that I wrote is a study told through stories and anecdotes, but a study of those behaviors and why they matter. And all that said, Angie, what I realized is the world definitely doesn't need another person's opinion about what it takes to be a good manager. you I mean, I'll walk out the door. I'll trip over a podcast, a book, or a uh, or um, an article in HBR about how to be a better manager. What I felt like the world needs, so it's not my opinion about how to be a better manager, actually. It's, it's a set of leadership behaviors that measurably and predictably lead to more engaged employees and better business outcomes. And that's what I think the world needs. It is the first of its kind kind of book. By the way, afterward, McKinsey has done a similar study that had similar findings. They still haven't quite acknowledged my book, but whatever. Um, and so I feel really good about that, you know? And so that's kind of what inspired is managers are failing and no one is helping. Everybody thinks they're helping. Every talking head, every author, they think they're helping. The problem is the corpus of stuff is too big. It's too much. It doesn't hang together in an integrated way. And none of it is held to measurable accounts. That's a big problem. It's just opinion after opinion after opinion. Like no wonder everybody sucks at managing. And by the way, by the way, like, I, defend, I quantitatively defend that managers have not improved in 30 years at scale. Um, you might have improved. I might have improved. But managers are not improving. Like, how is that even possible? Well, it's because 
too much stuff, doesn't hang together, um, and none of it's held to measurable account. So that was my inspiration. Managers are failing, common set of problems. The marketplace taught me their opinion of those problems. Then I studied it rigorously. Turned out they were pretty darn right. Um, and then wrote a book to help people know what is the ex- what are the right leadership behaviors to nail over and over and over that'll help your team be happier and, and deliver better. I want to go to a, a portion of your book too, and just to get some guidance. How do you lead up? Because that would be another act of bravery for anyone who is frustrated by their boss or manager. So much of your book is about again equipping managers with skills that are allowing them to be more results oriented and get their people to drive performance metrics. And sometimes your frustrations around your boss are prevalent. How do you do that? How do you lead up? Yeah, I I have a, you're right. I have a chapter called Coaching the Boss, um, which is designed to not only give people some insight on how to coach their boss, but also to convey to them as bosses, look how hard this is. Be better than that when you're the boss, right? Look how hard it is for you to have to get the courage to go coach your boss. Look at this process you have to follow. Be better than that. Make it easier on your people to coach you. Yeah, so so the basic idea is um, a lot of times we think we see something. It could be frustration with the boss. It could just be, I feel like we're missing this or this thing sucks on the team or whatever. Doesn't matter. Um, and ostensibly, the boss is blind to this because they're not they're not acting in a way that you think is right. And so I do, I put in a four four step actual process in the book for coaching the boss. Um, but I'm real careful that step one is actually to go gather your boss's unique context. And the reason for that is because I, I do find a lot of times that the junior person is really, really sure they're right when that right, who's right, who's wrong isn't really available. Valuable perspective, yeah. A perspective that maybe deserves to see the light of day, yeah. But right, that's tough, right? No, no objective truth in the workplace. So how can you possibly be right? So I like to coach people. Step one, go gather your boss's unique context. Um, boss, uh, tell me what you think or why this is happening. What do you think about X? And then just listen. With your boss's unique context now, you're in a much better position to decide if what you thought was so important and burning really needs to be said. And so then you kind of make a call, which is, okay, I should say something here. Um, or you bury it because you realize, oh, I, I didn't realize that's why it is the way it is. And you ask permission. Boss, I see things a little differently here than you do. Are you open to me offering you kind of how I see it? So you ask, literally ask permission. If your boss says no, you could leave. Leave that team. Polish up your resume. Get out. Like, <laughs> I anybody, said that, yeah. Not open to your feedback. It's, it's your team too. Like if a boss who doesn't want to hear that, uh, that that's a bad environment. Uh, but most bosses will say, yeah. Uh, um, and so now you got to do it. Now it's, it's Nike, just do it. Um, and you give the feedback and you make it a, a, a pursuit of shared truth. Now, in terms of frustration, like that's, that can be a little different. Um, here, here's what I, what I say. Life is way too short to be on a team with a bad boss. The boss you know, I, I say it's one of my sound bites that I defend rigorously in the or vigorously in the book and rigorously. Um, people just want to do great work and be totally psyched while doing it, and it is the direct manager more than any other factor who creates or destroys those circumstances, right? So, a bad boss, a frustrating boss, will make your life miserable. There, a lot of sometimes people say your boss more important than your therapist. Like that's where we are right now. So, life's too short. So, here's what I say: get ready to leave. Don't leave yet, but get ready to leave. What does that mean? Get a good resume. One page, by the way, never more than one page. I don't care who you are, or how far you are in your career. One page. Get a good resume together. Go out, poke around, identify companies or jobs you might like. And when you feel like it's safe that you have devised a good enough option, last ditch effort to tell your boss what's going on and how you feel. Because leaving is is risky. You know, it's like you don't know. Grass is not always greener. We all know that. So you owe it to yourself. If you're going to leave anyway, why not take a last ditch effort and saying, yo, boss, this is terrible. Like, I can't survive here. And then maybe things get better. Um, maybe not. And actually, probably not. And if they don't, you've got options devised on the side. If your boss is closed down to your perspective, you've got options devised on the side. I don't mean to suggest, I don't mean to, you know, say quit. But 
I, I, it's true. It's life's too short to work for a frustrating boss in a toxic workplace. Like just get out. There's good workplaces. They're hard to find, but they're there. And so get out. Um, but devise your options first, make a last ditch effort before you go to try to make it better. You owe it to yourself, I feel. And then if it doesn't work, get out. I like the logical and the emotional approach. And then going back to staying in your integrity, eventually stay in your integrity to make your decision. Russ, I know because you have many facilitated sessions, like you could go on for hours and I'm just grateful for this 30 minutes that you've given us your wisdom. How can people learn more about your work? Where can they go? How can they follow you? I know you post a lot on LinkedIn, which is great content, but if you could share with our listeners where we can learn more about you, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think LinkedIn's the easiest place. Um, I've got Twitter handle for me, plus the book. I've got Instagram handle for me in the book, Facebook for me in the for me in the book. Um, so I'm available in all those places. But I've I've just happened to have noticed there's far more engagement on the content on LinkedIn than anywhere else at this point. And so I tend to focus a lot of my effort there. So I'd say, and there's only like I think there's three Russ Laraways on LinkedIn. The other two don't have a picture. Uh, I'm the only no hair Russ Laraway. Um, and so I'm real easy to find there. Um, so I'd say that's the best place. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on the bet on you program. Yeah, absolutely. I hope you enjoyed Russ's conversation as much as I did. And I want to talk about the three things I pulled away from our time together. I love the idea and I firmly believe this too. I think I've got an overly optimistic viewpoint of the workforce that we're in. But Russ said it too, people want to do great work. You know that's true about yourself. And then you go to work, you're like, gosh, all these miserable people. Nobody wants to be miserable. But sometimes they just don't know how to find their way out of misery. And if you're a manager or if you're a person of influence, you don't need a title to be a person of influence, you can make the workplace experience so much more positive just by being your best self. So going to work, trying to think, how do I be my best today? And knowing that you have a tremendous amount of influence on the people around you who also want to do great that day. So really take ownership of just what you carry with you, whether you go to work, whether you come home, wherever you are, just own that. Second thing that I thought was really important from the conversation, when faced with difficult decisions, stay in integrity with yourself, understand your underlying principles. And that might be be a concept that you would get to, right? And you agree to like, wow, I need to stay integrity with myself, but reflecting a little bit about what exactly that means for you. What does being in integrity with yourself, because that is going to guide you. That's like your North star in decision-making. So as you think about the risks that you want to take, whether it's in a conversation or whether it's in your career or maybe even a career change, how do you stay in integrity with yourself? And I love the idea of difficult relationships, not just the the notion of having radical candor, but more specifically about finding shared truth. Like I've got my truth, you've got your truth. We can probably get somewhere if we expand the pool of understanding about what the situation is. So whether it's a disagreement that you have with a child or your partner or a colleague, or you need to give somebody just some uncomfortable, awkward feedback. Think about it, not only just from an empathetic point of view, how might they want to hear this, but think about how you can use your skill and just expanding what you both can agree upon for truth. Because I find too that in life, we have more in common of what we agree upon with people who we're in disagreement with and the actual issue that we disagree on. So thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Bet On You. Just want to share with you as well, if you're seeking a career transformation, do not forget about my e-course. Now it's time for you, how to lead your career transformation. And also don't forget to visit AngieConnect.com. I've got a host of free resources designed just to support you on your leadership development journey. Thank you everybody for listening. Go to AngieConnect.com. Cannot wait to hear from you next.